From the very beginning, I realized I saw the world differently than everyone else. That didn't sit well with some people. We're living in an age of fan fiction. Today, we're inundated with new stories that expand on and creatively reinvent old narratives. My name is Alexander Hamilton. It's the era of the reboot, the origin story, the cinematic universe, and the spin-off. She's a magical gal in a small town locale. Period pieces are remixing history or classic literature to reflect our modern sensibilities. What are you reading? Bleak House. Oh. It's so good. I'm such an Esther. I'm such an Esther, it's insane. Fanfiction-esque stories are also starting to present a more inclusive picture of society, just as one of the hallmarks of fanfiction is that it allows fans to put themselves into stories they love. We could hear his high heels clacking to us. Is Voldemort Come a drag on. queen? At its core, fanfiction is an exercise in wish fulfillment, an act of imagining the world as we'd like it to be. There's a document in here that looks to be fanfiction for the show Madam Secretary. The show leaves Terry one more. I'm just filling in the gaps. Here's our take on why fanfiction-esque stories rule the moment and how they empower us to remake life in the image of our fantasies. I've been lucky enough to appear in shows that fans were really passionate about. And you know what that means? Fan fiction. If you're new here, be sure to subscribe and hit the bell to be notified about all of our new videos. Arguably, fan fiction has been around for centuries. Shannon Chamberlain writes that after the publication of Gulliver's Travels in 1726, readers started to imagine its hero in circumstances that either were only briefly alluded to in the text or they themselves invented. The more shocking the revisions, the better. And what is Dante's Divine Comedy, John Milton's Paradise Lost, or even, some argue, the Book of Mormon, if not biblical fanfic? Let me show you the punishments that were revealed to Dante for the evils of lust, avarice, blasphemy. But the explosion of fanfiction came with the internet, especially tied to the rise of blogging and self-publishing in the post-millennium. Superfans of cultural behemoths like Harry Potter, Twilight, and One Direction could now connect with other superfans to collectively expand beloved story universes. I used to ship it a lot, and I know you've heard this before, but uh, Draco Harry. What is the affixiation with putting Draco in various different cast members of her? Uh, now we're seeing that fanfiction mentality having spread to big-budget mainstream stories. Essentially, the essence of fanfiction is reshaping and reclaiming existing stories to say something new or to illuminate an unexplored part of the story world, while adhering to the original story's spirit. Hey, I just want to take another look at you. Hey. What? I just want to take another look at you. The South Side Story Tumblr post outlines that fanfiction can take an array of different forms, like extension, a different point of view, addition, alteration, or alternate universes. Reboot culture, the blockbuster cinematic version of fanfiction, often involves combinations of extension, addition, and alteration, as continuity with past source material is disregarded. You're the spider-ling. Crime-fighting spider. You're spider-boy? Spider-Man. The Rise of the Planet of the Apes trilogy takes the extension approach to the original Planet of the Apes films, showing the steps it took for the Earth to become the dystopian future shown in the 1968 sci-fi classic, while dropping direct references to the first movie. Take your stinking paw off me, you damn dirty ape! Take your stinking paws off me, you damn dirty ape! Mad Max's reboot, Mad Max Fury Road, alters the original story, changing the protagonist from the titular Max to Charlize Theron's Imperator Furiosa. You want to get through this? Do as I say. Even the Daniel Craig-era James Bond and Benedict Cumberbatch's Sherlock borrow from fanfiction's willingness to change things that felt sacrosanct to the original character. Welcome, Martini. Chicken or stirred? Do I look like I give a damn? Nicotine batch. Helps me think. Impossible to sustain a smoking habit in London these days. Spider-Man Into the Spider-Verse shows how different iterations of the one Spider-Man idea can coexist. You're, You're like me. me. My name is Peter Parker. My name is Penny Parker. My name is Peter Parker. And the story acts as a neat metaphor for fanfiction in general. As Brian Bishop writes, In this film, Spider-Man isn't one particular person. It's an idea accessible to anyone, no matter where they come from or what they look like. Can I return it if it doesn't fit? It always fits. 
eventually. The very concept of the cinematic universe feels indebted to fanfic's ability to have concurrent stories working in tandem, feeding off each other. In a spin on the alternate universe category of fanfiction, there's also the type of story that translates older, less accessible texts or history into recognizable settings. In the 90s and early 2000s, teen movies took a fanfic approach by transposing classic works of literature from the likes of Shakespeare and Jane Austen onto high school. I burn, I pine, I perish. Clueless imagines Jane Austen's Emma. The Martins are of precisely the order of people with whom I feel I can have nothing to do. As the spoiled valley girl Cher Horowitz. Floaties generally hang on the grass scene all over there. No respectable girl actually dates them. Ten Things I Hate About You takes Shakespeare's The Taming of the Shrew from the Italian city of Padua to Padua High School in Seattle. I'm sure you won't find Padua any different than your old schools. While O made Othello a high school basketball star. You tell him I love that girl. I did. Well, I got played. Baz Luhrmann's Romeo and Juliet turned the Montagues and Capulets into rival gangs and reimagined Mercutio's speech about Queen Mab as referring to a party drug. With these clever acts of translation and through centering the young generation, classic stories that may have felt stuffy were brought up to date, without losing the themes or feel of the original text. But this alliance may so happy prove to turn your household rancor to pure love. Many of today's period pieces are undertaking a similar exercise, throwing out certain aspects of historical accuracy to instead draw parallels to our times and make room for creative, symbolic additions. The fairest wifely choices be right here in this room. My daughters were trained for battle, sir. Not the kitchen. Bridgerton, a fanfic spin on Regency romance that remixes echoes of Pride and Prejudice, is soundtracked by classical arrangements of contemporary pop. And its costuming, which consciously channels contemporary colors and silhouettes, feels more like cosplay. This interpretation of 1813 needed to be an overview of how can we add modern elements to it. We've introduced a modern color palette. Most significantly, it erases the racial hierarchy that would have been present at the time. We were two separate societies, divided by color, until a king fell in love with one of us. So Bridgerton is focused on giving us an opportunity to imagine what that era could have been like, and by extension, what our era could be like. Likewise, The Great, which declares itself to be an occasionally true story, frames the historical Catherine the Great as a relatable, idealistic young feminist. I will teach women to read and hopefully talk much on Descartes. The Great's creator, Tony McNamara, also played fast and loose with the historical accuracy in Queen Anne's court in The Favourite in order to make us think about gender roles. This week's ridiculous. A man must look pretty. And the dehumanizing effects of power hierarchies. You cannot have hot chocolate. Your stomach, the sugar inflames it. Abigail, hand me that cup. Do not. I'm sorry, I do not know what to do. These fanfic-inspired shows project modern situations and debates onto period backdrops. Babe, Nola is so chilly. You're gonna love it. There is a civil war starting. I am not moving to Louisiana. I'd be on the wrong side of history. Hey, this house's not all bad. Dickinson, a loose reimagining of the 1800s life of Emily Dickinson, portrays Emily not as the middle-aged woman she was when she wrote most of her best-known poems, but as a teenage girl in contemporary feeling situations. We have the whole house to ourselves for one night to do whatever we want. We need to throw one of our classic Dickinson house parties. Guest stars based on real people also fit modern archetypes. Little Women author Louisa May Alcott is a hustling, laser-focused hashtag girl boss. Yeah, I'm, I'm just trying to get paid. You know, I'm just about that hustle, so. Springfield Republican editor Sam Bowles is the tech bro disruptor. Move fast and break stuff. And Henry David Thoreau is a fake, privileged hipster slacker. A man only needs one set of clothes, you know despite the endless dictates of fashion. And what about your checkered trousers? They're in the bag. Plots explore contemporary fads like crystals, seances, or wellness, while the lead-up to the Civil War becomes a setup to reflect on today's polarized political environment. I have relatives in the South, and they're not bad people. Talk to them about how their way of life is an abomination. Oh, okay, well, that'll make for a nice Thanksgiving dinner. The Great similarly finds creative ways to let us see our present in the past, even portraying Catherine taking on anti-vaxxers in court by advocating for variolation, a precursor to vaccination. It is a way of helping your body reject the disease, used in some Asian countries with some success. You give yourself smallpox? That seems mad. 
In this looser approach, the past becomes recognizable to us. Maybe the characters aren't dressed or speaking the way people back then really did. This f duck is delicious. But the writing is actively finding analogies between past and present. And who's to say these things didn't feel comparable to things we go through today? I hate my life and I truly want to die. And that's exactly why we need a spa day. The exercise might reveal that, however much has changed between then and now, a lot has stayed the same. Every woman is not afforded such gallant protection. Well, every woman is not a lady. Conversely, the things that truly were different stand out, like the prevalence of sudden death and the total power that monarchs or ruling classes had over everyone else, which might make us appreciate that, while there's still a great ways to go, we have progressed greatly in certain ways. What about treatments? Nobility we try, but servants. Believe me, I know it is difficult to find good service people, but there will be others. You burn them all? It is standard process. Because it's told by such a diverse cast with such a diverse styles of music, we have the opportunity to reclaim a history that some of us don't necessarily think is our own. Fan fiction's greatest trick is its ability to include new audiences into mainstream universes that previously may have felt inaccessible and exclusive. The majority of writers of queer fan fiction are queer themselves, and it's a way for them to explore their identity in lots of different safe spaces. Writer Rose Damu summed up her love of fan fiction on the Las Culturistas podcast, saying it was the first time she realized culture could be for her. You were allowed to play in their sandbox and and like remix what they had created and live in that world. Robin Talley, author of As I Descended, says that the practice of queering the canon is important as it shows readers that there is nothing inherently straight, and for that matter, nothing inherently male, white, or Christian, etc., about the stories that we think of as defining our culture. And we can increasingly see the inclusivity of fanfic trickling up into the mainstream, like in the choice to gender swap Ocean's Eleven and Ghostbusters. Let's go. Let's go. Oh, oh did you want to? Sorry. I'll let you. I'll let you. Or to center a woman and cast a black man and Asian woman as supporting leads in the Star Wars sequel trilogy. That's how we're gonna win. Not fighting what we hate. Saving what we love. Fans who imagined Hermione Granger as a person of color or Doctor Who's doctor as a woman were vindicated when Noma Dumezweni was cast as Hermione in the play Harry Potter and the Cursed Child. There was all this buzz, obviously, when you got cast. Everyone was like, I wonder why. <laughs> I wonder. Something's different that you got you and Emma Watson. <laughs> and Jodie Whittaker became the latest regeneration of the Doctor. What are you? Ooh, okay, don't like questions, more the private type. I get that. The erotic aspect of much fan fiction has also been influential, as we can see in the huge success of Fifty Shades of Grey, which famously began as Twilight fan fiction that replaced the original's vampire story and its connotations of chastity with fantasies of BDSM. My tastes are very singular. You wouldn't understand. Enlighten me then. Jacqueline Friedman argues that erotic fan fiction fills important gaps in the mainstream, saying these stories focus on female desire and what's in it for the woman, and there's not a lot of that in mainstream culture. I'm writing for the teenage girls who are like, oh, it's not weird for me to be curious about sex and want to talk about sex. And equally important, they're filmed from a woman's perspective. There are concerns that mainstream media is just scratching the surface of the radical inclusivity actual fanfiction represents. Sherlock fans who wanted to see Sherlock and John as more than friends or Sherlock and Moriarty as more than enemies only got a near kiss in a fantasy sequence that was more queer baiting than representation. What? Are you out of your mind? I don't see why not. And heterosexual fanfiction still often rises to the top, as we see in the romance After, which is inspired by straight Harry Styles fanfic. Anna had to change the One Direction name, so Harry Styles became Hart and Scott. But otherwise, things remain the same. Even though most One Direction fanfiction involves Larry shipping about Harry Styles and Louis Tomlinson. What made her famous was her story, The First Night. A 7,000 word fic that was largely credited with starting the Larry Stylinson conspiracy theory. The fanfiction esque approach to inclusivity can also veer into tokenism. And they'll put some up front and say, look what we're doing. And at the moment, they're using John Boyega. So you think, do you think John Boyega is being used as a token? To, yeah. to... And they gave him a BAFTA as a token, you know, it's almost like a token gesture to say, look, we've got our, we're doing, we're being diverse. Still, we are seeing breakthroughs in making space for queerness in existing narratives, like Billy Porter playing the fairy godmother as non binary in 2021 Cinderella remake. We are presenting this character as genderless. This is a classic fairy tale uh, for a new generation. Not 
not everyone is happy about the ascendancy of the fanfic mindset. I've long been an opponent of fan fiction. Oh, his characters are his characters. Uh, for us, it doesn't have much effect because none of it is very powerful. One of the problems with fanfiction-esque narratives is that it can lead to pandering. The Guardian's Mark Lawson writes that it can make shows feel like a chat room for aficionados rather than a program for a general audience. The Mandalorian was criticized in its second season for writing a young Luke Skywalker into the show to please fans, without, as Max Every writes, really adding anything to him. Are you a Jedi? I am. Fan service in the form of excessive Easter eggs can sometimes offer little creative value to a story beyond making super fans feel in the know. This film is all about a hidden Easter egg, and there's also loads of fan references all over. In the remixed period piece approach, there can also be tonal challenges that result from throwing certain aspects of the past out while preserving others. In Bridgerton, we're given an alternate history where black people can be queens and dukes, but in this fantasy, it can be jarring that sexism and heteronormativity are still rampant. We live on a constant threat of danger, Bridgerton. I risk my life every day for love. Dickinson, on the other hand, isn't colorblind and takes a more historically accurate approach to pre-Civil War Northern racial dynamics, and it at least pays lip service to the sexism and homophobia of the times. There are girls in the lecture room, sir! Dressed as men! But the seriousness of these topics risks feeling undermined by the lightness of the other plots and overall playfulness of the show. Not everyone agrees that Shakespeare is suitable for... For who? For... young ladies. George... You are being so lame. There's also an argument that some fanfiction-esque narratives, like origin stories that humanize a purposely cardboard villain, don't need to exist. The reason why we loved all these villains when we were kids was like because they were bad, not in yes. spite of it. Ryan Murphy's Ratchet, about one flew over the cuckoo's nest villain Nurse Ratchet, ignores the fact that the original Nurse Ratchet was meant to be one dimensional because she was a metaphor for the cruelty of society as a whole, a critique that's undercut by fleshing her out and making us feel for her. Because your family doesn't ever want to see you again. It's something I wish someone had told me when I was young. So I could stop believing otherwise. Perhaps the deepest problems with the wish fulfillment approach to storytelling is that it risks losing the values of realism. I am a twisted, witchy, creative, horny woman, and you can't accept that. You can't accept me! What is happening? Presenting our society, or a past one, as some kind of fun, rap soundtrack, colorblind social utopia may be fun, but does it risk being a little frivolous? It's not too much, is it? No. Some argue that stories should show the world as it really is, not as we would like it to be. Still, when the fanfiction narrative is done well, any sacrifice of surface truth or naturalism can be in service of a deeper emotional truth and timely insight. You have wars to fight, Emily Dickinson. But you must fight them in secret. They must be a nobody. We can read a hopefulness in today's impulse to realize creative utopias on screen. The world is more influx than ever, with issues like climate change and rapidly shifting social mores forcing audiences to consider what the future of the world could and should look like. We can't save the world by playing by the rules. The rules have to be changed. Life imitates art, and since fan fiction empowers audiences to make stories over as we wish them to be, it just may help us manifest a reality that doesn't make these utopias feel like such a fantasy. Those very things are precisely what have allowed a new day to begin to dawn in this society. I remember when Veronica Mars uh, came out with its new season. It was just so both nostalgic and current, and I loved it, and I loved the characters, and it was so much fun. So I really felt like a real fan who had been heard. Yeah, I've been on a kick lately. I've been watching Dickinson and um, The Great, a lot of these period pieces that don't really care about realism so much as kind of imagining these past eras, how we would like to think of them or translating modern issues. Do you want to go for a run before dinner? A run? Yeah, I, I love to run. That's like an actual fact about me. You know, I think they're so much fun. What's really interesting about what ha what's, what's happening with these um, more fan fiction style 
shows is that you're sometimes getting at a deeper truth of how something might have felt like or how we would feel if we put ourselves into it because we can never really know what it felt like, you know, to live as Catherine the Great or Emily Dickinson or any person in that time. Saying that, it was thinking a key element is always the music and the score. And when it's using current music, I like to make money, get turn. It, it's so, it connects in a visceral way to how we're feeling emotionally. And somehow it makes this past or historic world come to life today, which is just so fun because um, you both feel it and see it. A lot of times, period pieces that are more trying to be accurate on the surface, they feel kind of dreary or subdued. And it's like, they were still people like us. They lived like us. They felt a lot of the things we feel. And so I think sometimes, you know, when you worry too much about surface realism or naturalism, you kind of can miss the deeper truth of, of what the experience is. You've said this too, and it's always something that sticks with me is that, you know, the best period piece is not about the period in which it's set. That's it's so the period true. in which it's made. Tom Jones, we always talk about, is the swinging 60s. Bonnie, Greece. Five, China. Yeah, China. I always think the most interesting period pieces are really about the time in which they're made. The days are gone when it was possible for a woman to live her whole life as a girl. Because that's what you can really speak to most honestly. 